The following primary and secondary modcast is brought to you by Forge Tactical Training. Forge Tactical is focused on supporting the mission of our nation's armed citizens, law enforcement officers, and military professionals through evolved, realistic training. Hey everyone, Matt Landfair here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. This is Modcast number 133. Today is February 8th, 2018. The title may say how to talk to women in the gun industry, but the real subject is more about how, how women are navigating this whole gun industry. Um, we're going to talk about, actually rather, I'm not going to do much talking. As per the norm, I'm going to do more listening. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, misconceptions, uh, the hurdles they have to go through, um, yeah, various options, uh, different learning techniques or methods. It's going to be an interesting discussion for me. I'm hoping I can convince my wife to actually finally listen to one of these shows. Uh, maybe she might be motivated to start shooting with me. We'll see. So um, <laughs> my background's in law enforcement. Within law enforcement, I have had some female uh, co-workers. Uh, I've always had co-workers that were, the female co-workers have always been a uh, motivated bunch, always wanted to go shoot. I've been really fortunate with that. I haven't had many um, of the opposite. However, my wife doesn't want to go shoot. My wife is not one that's big on guns. So hopefully we can talk about means and ways to maybe motivate our wives to shoot and carry guns. We'll see. So uh, let's go further into these intros. Actually, before intros, uh, big thanks to Forge Tactical Training, uh, forgetactical.com, uh, Chappie and Doc Spears, two wonderful guys, great instructors. Chappie, in fact, even has a book out right now. Um, they are um, sponsors for this episode, as is Facts on Firearms. They're providing some high quality AR-15 as well as pistol barrels. Um, if you want to learn more, if you look up the What Would Stoner Do rifle project on in range they're using one of the facts on barrels and it's doing very well lastly uh varg freeborn with one life defense violence of mind another sponsor of the episode uh check out varg varg has some awesome lectures not only is he doing a lecture series but he's also teaching um all kinds of classes hands-on shooting all that kind of stuff definitely worth your uh attention worth your time so Let's go to Grace and find out about this Grace person. She was on last week. Now she's going to get to talk a little bit more about her background within firearms. Thanks, Matt. Um, let's see. I started shooting when I was 19 years old. I'd had a fascination with guns ever since I was a little kid, though. But I didn't really get a chance to go into it and learn how to actually shoot real firearms. So I was about 19. And at that point, I took some classes, got into competition shooting, and eventually was approached by the uh, training and range director at the range I shot at to be an instructor. So from there, I started instructing, got credentialed, and I've had the opportunity and the honor, actually, of teaching thousands and thousands of students over the past nine years. And men, women, children, uh, I've worked a little bit with military, a little bit with law enforcement, and it has been absolutely awesome. So. I would say about five years ago, I started teaching at West Coast Armory in Bellevue, Washington. And there I took over the training department and heading that up. And um, about six months ago, I decided to give up my lifelong passion of teaching for something a little bit different. So I joined the BE Myers and Co team, which has been absolutely awesome. I'm doing marketing here, working with the mall, the glare recoil, um, the new boards M2, et cetera. And that's pretty much my background, some local competition shooting and in three gun and pistol and a long time teaching, so. Cool. And then we have Mia. 
Yes, I probably as opposite as you could be <laughs> to that background. I when I grew up, um, I had absolutely no exposure to firearms or guns. In fact, I was raised to believe that only two people needed guns: cops and crooks. And other than that, you just dial nine one one. Um, I became a DA with LA County. I was assigned to Compton. And even then, I, I didn't have an interest in firearms, even though it was recommended to me by my office to carry one at one point for my protection. I was afraid of them. I thought that um, because I didn't know how to use one, I would hurt myself or somebody else, that I was better off swinging a golf club or a baseball bat than trying to carry a gun. Um, after I left the DA's office, I went into private practice, civil litigation, and then um, I slowed things down and I became, um, I, I started working part time and I realized, you know what, I want to catch up on all the things that I, I always wanted to do, but career got in the way. So I went through my bucket list of things like learning how to cook and <laughs> figuring out the washing machine. And, and I decided I was going to take a shooting lesson just, just for kicks. And I remember afterwards being so surprised that it wasn't at all what I thought it was going to be. It wasn't violent. It wasn't aggro. It wasn't um, over the top because up until that point, that's what I believed guns were all about and people that liked guns were all about. And um, in fact, it reminded me a lot of golf. You have to be calm. You have to be focused, take your time, et cetera, et cetera, the follow through. So I was intrigued. I wanted to take more lessons um, and I didn't know where to find them. When I Googled guns and lessons, you know, all I came up with was pictures of guys in camo blowing up windshields with their ARs. And I thought to myself, I can't be the only woman out there who wants to learn how to shoot a gun. And so, um, you know, I tried to go to the range and I tried to rent a gun and <laughs> the guy, the guys there were kind because I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing. I just walked up and I said, I want to rent a gun. And he said, okay, which one? I had no idea. And then he looked at me, he goes, do you want some ammo with that? I said, oh, yeah, sure, that'd be a great idea. <laughs> do you want some targets with that? So long story short, um, I, I tried to seek out more information. And then um, I signed up for a class, and I was the only woman. And I walked in, and it was a bunch of gang cops who had been shooting for 20 years. And I almost turned around and walked right out. I was so intimidated. And I told the instructor um, that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a beginner. I don't really know what I'm doing. So please don't um, hold up the class for me. And I'll never forget, he told me, you know, my female shooters tend to make my best students because you guys just listen better. And I guarantee you, you're going to be really happy by the end of the day. And he was absolutely right. I was astounded at what, what I was able to do by the end of the day. And I got excited and I wanted all my girlfriends to experience this, but I knew they would never go to a class full of guys you know, they'd be intimidated as well. So I um, thought to myself, okay, if I could create my ideal class for women, what would it look like? And that's how I came across Mike Pannone. And we put together a couple classes and they sold out. And um, that's how Guntra started. And then we started flying to Austin, to Northern California, trying to do classes wherever we could. I had women flying from Chicago to Austin to take a class, women flying from Boston to California to take a class. And what I was finding was that these women were a lot like me. They'd always wanted to learn how to shoot, but they came from backgrounds where they just had no exposure to them, or they lived and worked in communities where it wasn't very gun friendly. I had anti-gun women come to my class. I had women who are literally dragged there by their husbands <laughs> because their husbands wanted them to learn how to operate a firearm and they knew Mike was a good teacher and these women didn't want to be there where their husbands were making them and um, by the end of it we had to pry them off the range they loved it so much and um, so th now that's where I am I got certified as well as an instructor I've been training more and more with Mike and um, we're hoping to keep expanding gun trust to um, expand this like this female only class. Um, we're also thinking about couples classes because we've, we've gotten requests for that as well. So I have two, uh, I have one comment and one question for you then. Sure. The, the, the fact that you just, yeah, Mike Pannone, yeah, no big deal. Yeah. just had him come out. That's a big deal. <laughs> well, you know, that's, deal. A, that's a funny story because uh, I didn't know who he was. Someone just told me you have to meet him. I met him. We hit it off. And the women who come to the class have no idea who he is. So I do a little intro, tell them about his background. And um, I told Mike, 
when I first met him, I said, so I heard you're with Delta. And I got to tell you, the only thing I know about Delta was that I think Rambo was in Delta. <laughs> but other than that, I don't really know much about the military. Um, I'm sorry, you know, no disrespect to you. I just, that's just where I'm coming from. Um, and then the husbands and the boyfriends and the guys that come by or stop by, you see them taking pictures of Mike, asking to take selfies with him, asking to shake his hand, just to be in the same, you know, in space with him. It's really kind of funny. But um, the, but at the same time, because the women aren't awed by Mike because they don't know anything about him beforehand, they really appreciate the quality of his instruction. They can see him for what, for the, the kind of instructor that he is without yeah. being swayed by all the, um, the hype. Yeah. And then you said when you uh, went to rent a, a firearm to, to shoot at the range, did the gun counter guy recommend a snub-nosed revolver? No, he, he said uh, he, he was really good because he said, uh, well, what did you shoot before? And I said, I told him what I had shot in that lesson that I had taken. So he says, well, let's try that one. And that particular range was um, very female friendly. Thank goodness. Because it had, I had a bad experience. I can tell you right now, I probably never would have gone back. So um, he was good by asking me, what, what have you shot before? Did you like it? Were you comfortable with it? And he found me the same gun, but he said he would find me something similar if he couldn't find it. So for the two of you, when you're online, what do you think, what's the biggest uh, misconception that you're running into? Or what's the biggest thing that you normally have to clear up? when you're in some kind of a discussion or you read something online and go, Oh, that's just wrong. And you're compelled to respond. Oh, gee, where do I begin? <laughs> um, Grace, you want to go first? Sure. Um, honestly, I don't, because I've been in the gun industry and online and I like had a blog and my own training company for a while and stuff. Um, I really don't have, those issues because I've been submerged in it for so long that I don't know, I can now nav I navigate it well enough that I, I think if something pops up, like for example, um, on the Facebook post you posted Matt about, um, you know, the, the podcast tonight, uh, I have no problem just kind of nipping it in the butt and moving on, you know? So I don't have any issues with that. I will say that I was really, really impressed with how respectful all the guys were at shot. It was all yes, ma'am, like super respectful and online as well. So, and I haven't had people question my, my skills or knowledge, so. Do you think that had to do with though, that you're right next to the mall? Cause that mall, it's impressive. I'm just saying. It is pretty impressive. It is pretty impressive. Could have a little something to do with it. So Mia, what do you have? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Um, they talk to me like I'm slow. <laughs> oh. They, they, well, they talk to you like you're a child and they start treating you like a child and um, the condescension comes out um, and yeah, they hand you a small gun or a pink gun or they think, you know, a, you know, you can't handle a, a bigger <clears throat> gun Um and I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a range where it's my first time at the range and the range master will just zero in on me and he'll be right over my shoulder asking me, have you shot before? Do you know how to handle that gun? Do you know what you're doing? You know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, the best, I, I understand where he's coming from. So I'll just say, yes, I have. And it has to come to the point where I have to show him how I'm handling my gun and then he backs off. Um, when I went to get my CCW permit, the instru I was the only woman in the room, and the, and the instructor looked around, sees me, looks right at me, and he's, but he's at addressing the group, and says, how many of you have um, um, shot at least five times, at least, you know, ten times, at least twenty times? And then at one point, he asked me, and only me, do you generally hit what you aim at? <laughs> and I had to say, Whoa. yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, and when we went to go qualify, yeah, I, I had my moment and I got to outshoot all the guys in the class. But, you know, it's like you kind of have to, you wish you didn't have to put up with that every time, but it, it, it happens. Now, it doesn't happen 100% of the time. I've noticed that 
more and more, there are men out there who are extremely encouraging, who don't talk down to you, who will actually tell you, it's really great to see women out here. I wish we could see more women out here shooting. You know, I wish my wife, girlfriend, you know, sister, whatever would come out as well. Um, or they'd ask, like, you know, what kind of gun are you shooting? Because I want to get my wife, sister, girlfriend, whatever, interested. And, you know, maybe I can have her shoot the same kind of gun that you're shooting. Do you like it? Et cetera. Um, and or they'll see, you know, the holster that I'm wearing and ask me, do you like that holster? Because it's kind of like they want they think if they can buy um, the right gun or the right holster or the right equipment for the female in their life, that that'll encourage her to come out and shoot with them. And so, um, yeah, the, the first thing is that they think I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And in fact, I was just telling Mike the other day when I was at SHOT, I went to, you see the, you know, the, the Glock booth, the SIG booth, and you can tell they're, they're really trying to, and they are, they're with the times. They've got women on the floor. They're very modern looking. And you don't see those, you know, gun bunny models walking around. And I was wandering around and I came across another gun booth. Um, where they still had the gun bunny models and I was playing around with the guns and the guy behind the, the, the counter, I guess, noticed that I was interested. We had a, a good conversation about the guns and he made a genuine effort to, you know, I was saying goodbye and I, I knew he meant well, but the only thing he could come up with as like a parting gift to like kind of seal the deal, so to speak, was to give me these pink and purple, um, gun charms they were like made of some kind of silicone rubber and it was a keychain and you know he, yeah and inside i kind of sighed a little bit <laughs> i knew he meant well but he had no other way to express you know t towards a woman how much he appreciated the conversation and 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 he couldn't find any other common ground so um well it, i yeah, think annette would have appreciated the purple gun <laughs> yeah yeah, so it's, you yeah. know, at, at the end of the day, women are, you know, we're just as intelligent, you know, t intelligent enough to have a conversation about a firearm. Yes, we will ask more questions. And yes, we may not be as familiar with the technical terms, but, you know, our capacity to pick up on detail is, is pretty remarkable. And that was one thing we noticed in our classes. So, you know, if the whole, already the, the, preconception from the women's side is that this is a man's world. I don't belong here and I don't know what I'm doing and um, they're going to give me a hard time. So the fact that a guy would talk to her like another human being versus a retarded child is going to be the first positive step towards making her feel comfortable. And, and for me, I kind of identify with some of this with you know, if this can encourage my wife to actually shoot, I will go buy a pink gun. I don't care. Whatever it takes. But ultimately, I just have to accept, you know, if she's not interested, there's nothing I can do. Except for do a podcast like this and, have her, and force her to listen. <laughs> you know, when it comes to guns for women, um, we found it's what makes what feels comfortable in her hand and what feels comfortable for her to shoot. Because we've had women come to the class with guns that were pre-selected for them by their, their husbands or their boyfriends, and they're struggling with them in the class. And um, we have what we call a gun buffet. We'll have all different kinds of guns, and we'll match a gun to the woman. And there was one woman who um, Mike introduced to the Dan Wesson um, 1911s, and she turned around and bought four of them. She loved them so much. And there was another woman who came with a Glock 26. She was struggling with it. She said her husband told her to bring, he bought that for her for the class, saying gun. she's a small woman, so she needs a small gun. And she was fighting it. We gave her a Glock 17, and she loved it. She was ringing steel from 40 yards out. So, you know, it's, if, if, they, if, they, if the gun feels comfortable in their hand when they shoot it and when they're manipulating it, then um, the, rest, the rest will come. The rest will just flow from that. Now, how does that work then with also carry options? So if, the, if you have someone of a smaller build enjoying a Glock 17 better, how does that translate then into them actually carrying? That's a good question. Obviously, a Glock 17 is going to be a challenge to carry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's the other part of the gun buffet, bringing guns that are more easily concealable. 
And for a while, it was a pretty limited option, uh, limited array, especially in California. But, um, uh, you know, with this last SHOT show, I've noticed a, a, a few more models coming out, especially that new SIG, the P365. Yeah. Yeah. That got, I noticed right after, when that came out, I saw a lot of posts from a lot of different women. And these are just like, they're not Insta celebrities in any way. They're just regular women who are posting pictures of their kids, their dog, and their gun. And they love the 365. It's just right. It's not too small where your pinky's dangling off the end. You know, it doesn't feel too chubby in your hand. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, you have to find the way. And, it, you know, it won't bulge out of your waistband. And it won't bulge out of your dress. So it's, yeah. And it's the, the big gun and finding them a gun on the range is one thing to get them past the whole you yeah. know, fiddling with the grip or fiddling with the, the release, um, then they get comfortable with it. Then they're having fun with it. They're not thinking about fidgeting with the gun. Then they start getting interested in everything else related to guns. Well, what other guns are there? What's this one called? You know, can I swap guns with you? You know, I, I like the feel of this one. How come this has, you know, this little lever on it and that one doesn't? So it just gets them, it gets them thinking and interested about guns. And, and just like we said, I think we discussed this just prior to officially starting, there's no one right answer. There are so many, and, and also along with body types and sizes, I'm carrying a CZ P09 with 21 rounders appendix. Well, not everyone can do that. The 365 might be a little small for me, but it worked. if it works for some people, it may not work for every, everyone. I really like those concepts that you're bringing up though. Yeah, I actually had a guy ask me at SHOT, what's the best, because he was teaching a group of women, he said, what's the best way for women to carry? And I said, I can't answer that question because it depends on the woman. It depends on her build. It depends on, you know, her curves or lack thereof. It depends on, I said, some women uh, want to carry on their body. Some women cannot carry on their body. They have physical limitations, you know, the back issues or whatnot. So they have to purse carry. Um, others are afraid if they purse carry, the little kids will get into their bag. Um, so they want to carry on their body. There are women who are petite or they wear a lot of dresses and skirts and suits, so they can't necessarily wear a belt. So they'll find some other way to strap it to their body. Um, I have, I think, a rainbow variety of holsters, not just IWB. Um, to, and it really depends on what I wear. also depends on the weather. I have a summer gun and I have a winter gun. <laughs> Because in the summertime, obviously, there's, especially in California, you know, you don't want to bulk up too much. So I have a, a little 380, a Colt Mustang pocket light that I carry in the summer. But my gun of preference is a Glock 19 because I have, I got the, the grip reduced by um, Boresight Solutions. And I love that gun. So it all depends. There's not one gun that's going to fit every woman. And there's certainly not one way for um, every woman to carry. Yeah. And I would, I would certainly agree with that to an extent, but I also think that um, like there's still a line of what is like a sound, um, a sound place to carry, right? Or how you're carrying a, a good method versus a method that may actually end up being dangerous. So, I mean, there's a fine line. I, personally, I don't recommend that people just, you know, oh, well, I prefer it. I, I don't know. I've seen some weird stuff, right? We've all probably seen some weird stuff. I'm sure you've seen some weird stuff, Mia, <laughs> right? But I think that um, it's absolutely good, good to find like what works for the person gun-wise, holster-wise, all that kind of stuff. But there's still, there's still definitely principles of good carry. And I think it's important that we, people also realize that going into it. Yeah, and that's where the training becomes really key. As you know, um, Mike does... Um, he does a lot of concealed carry classes and he's now doing those. Um, I think it's on Wednesdays. He posts those little videos about concealed carry tips and we started incorporating them in the classes and, um, and it, it really took off with the women because yeah, they can carry, but how do you use it once you carry? And that was, that, that was a, there was a gap there that um, wasn't really being serviced before. Um, and I, yeah, I agree with you, Grace. It's, it's really important on where I've seen some really dangerous things <laughs> being posted or just, I'm, I'm seeing women carry or they take a picture of themselves, you know, carrying. And I'm thinking, how does that work? 
Like, I think my favorite one was um, uh, someone was saying they were doing yoga while carrying a gun in their waistband. And I thought, that's impossible. Because the way you move in yoga, I mean, either that thing's going to slip out or you're lying on it because you're lying on your stomach or you're lying on your back. And um, yeah, and that was that was one example where I thought, no, I think I think she's full of it. (laughs) So, yeah, no, I I absolutely agree. If you're caring, you have to practice how you're going to pull, draw it and, and fire it and and um, and use it and certainly hope that it stays on you as you move around your day. Yeah. So what are some of the trends that you guys are seeing that are kind of throwing red flags that are kind of uh, giving you concern? Red flags regarding? Uh, Basically carry for women. Mm -hmm. Because I know that, yeah, they're all, they're all these products and stuff. Well, this is for women. I would say for me, it's, yeah, it's like cheap holsters, like not solid, good holsters. That would be my biggest concern because that's, as we know, that's the most dangerous part, right? The takeoff and landing, the draw and the reholster. So having a solid foundation that you're working from is really important and you see people making all sorts of cloth holsters, et cetera, that are not, in my opinion, not as safe as a good solid holster, you know, leather, kydex, et cetera. Yeah, they may look cute, but the retention's not there or that trigger, it's going to snag <laughs> or, um, or something. Yeah, it's... Um, um, and yeah, it's, it's tricky because it, you know, you want to appeal to the female audience. So naturally some people are going to go overboard on the whole aesthetic thing. Like, Oh, look, you know, there's lace or it's bright, pretty colors or, you know, or whatever it is they decide to embellish it with. But ultimately you want to know, is this going to work? And you don't know until you try it. Yeah. I've wasted many wh- posters. I can tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> What are some of the sources that you guys have found to be um, good to help you navigate through that kind of crap without needing to spend your own money to find out? Or have there been any? um, I I really wish that there were more reviews. And some of the websites have posted reviews. But you know how you go on like Amazon and you you read all the reviews to see what people have said. I kind of wish that there, there was more of that. Um, especially from women using these particular holsters. Um, I try to zoom in on the picture to see the, the, I read what the material is and I try to zoom in on the picture to see the details and try to get an idea of, of um, whether my gun would actually fit that well in it. Um, yeah, I know that's one of the examples I give when people talk about, oh, well, it has these great reviews. Well, you know, reviews from an anonymous source really don't mean much. Look up, say, Condor on Amazon and read all the great reviews or look up some brand that's not the best. And it probably has a 4.8 and everyone's saying how wonderful it is. But if you talk to people that know better, that's not really that good of, a, of an option. So yeah. what about, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that for me, I've got my rig pretty much figured out, so I don't. Have, I don't go out looking for holsters too much. Like Tenacor has been really awesome for me for concealing like Glock 17, Glock 19. Um, but, you know, a lot of it comes down to two is talking to those instructors who are working with people all the time because they see everything coming through. So Mia sees a ton of stuff coming through. Mike sees a ton of stuff coming through and they're able to see what's working and what's not working without actually having to go out and buy it. And like, personally, I tap into, I talk a lot to the insights training center instructors like Greg Hamilton, um, because they've seen all of it and they do combatives with it. So you know how it's going to hold up. Uh, and, and that's big too. Like that's a huge factor that people forget. They're like, Oh, it's a woman's holster. It can, it just needs to stay. If she's standing up, it's like, well, chances are 
there's a good chance whatever you're doing may turn into something where you're rolling around, you're fighting, you're in combatives. And is that whole sort of women? Look? That doesn't Oh yeah, no, women. we're That's never just silly. No. Women are no. never victimized. No. Wow. Um, but is it is it something that's gonna hold up to that? Is somebody gonna be able to reach, grab the holster and literally rip it off of your belt? Because that's a real thing. Like there are well-known holsters out there that will absolutely can be ripped off of a belt, cracked, just completely destroyed. And it has to hold up to your retention. So if you're retaining it and you don't want someone taking your gun from you, is your holster going to hold up to that? Can you hold the gun in the holster, have someone try to pull it out, lift you up off the ground, and the holster remains completely okay, right? So for me, I go through a pretty rig rigorous, um, ever-rigorous expectations. That's why I like Tenacore. But, you know, not every woman maybe is trained or not every person in general is trained in retention and that kind of thing. So for them, it may be a little bit less of a concern but also you don't know what you don't know. So is there a perfect resource out there? In my opinion, the best resource is going and talking to the instructors, of course, working with people on this day in and day out. Yeah, ideally you'd want to walk into a, a brick and mortar store like a Macy's or something and be able to try stuff on, but it, it, that doesn't happen, um, especially in California. Um, but what one another, I just realized there's another way that I get information is um, when I go through social media and I see other women who are wearing like a particular type of, it could be the shorts, those spandex shorts with mm -hmm. the holster sewn in, or they have a particular holster maker that they, they seem to be crazy about, or a belly band that they seem to be crazy about. I'll actually, I'll message them or I'll, you know, write a message on their wall and say, you know, I've been. Uh, you know, what do you think about that? How long have you had it? Are you happy with it? Do you just carry that gun with it? Um, you know, do you work out in it? And, um, and then they, you know, they respond back. And it reminds me a lot of, and I was telling Mike this, if you like go on like, you know, Nordstrom's.com or some shoe site where you have a lot of women who are posting feedback, they get really detailed <laughs> about the pros and the cons and, and where they've used it before, what they compare it to. And, and, um, and it gives you a, a better illustration in your head, especially for me, because um, when they start comparing it to other things that they've used, or they tell me about what activities that they, they do when they're wearing that particular type of holster, then I, it gives me a better idea of, of um, whether or not something like that worked for me. But I, it, the key thing is I, I need to know what kind of gun they're holding in that particular holster. That's my favorite thing to ask when someone says, hey, I'm using this holster. I love it. Okay, what else have you used? What, yeah. what can we care, compare this to? What's your frame of reference? Right. Okay, so topic came up in the chat before we even started talking about the clothing issue. As gun-toting females, how is it to, how much more difficult is it, is it to dress around the gun if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I, I've heard that before. It, do we dress around the gun or, or vice versa? And one thing I'm, I, I've noticed is that um, if, I mean, if you don't like what you're wearing, if you don't feel pretty in it, you're not going to wear it. It's just <laughs> that bulky sweater or whatever is going to just hang out in the back of your closet forever. So it's easier if you can figure out how to make the gun work with her wardrobe. And there's, there's different ways to do it. And some people, some women are pretty resourceful. Um, you know, prints are in right now and um, big flowy tops are in right now. So that's an easy one. Um, the tricky part is when you're wearing something sheer, where you are something clingy, you know, what do you do then? So then that's when you see women wearing um, the belly band around their, in, in the small of their back for example, or some kind of garter holster. Um, but um, it's easier if she keeps with her particular style and makes the gun work with her wardrobe rather than buy bulky, baggy clothes just so she can hide a gun. Because if she's not going to feel comfortable wearing that particular wardrobe that she normally doesn't wear, she's, she's not going to want to wear those clothes and she's going to end up not caring. Yeah, that is a balance I have no idea about. I'm glad I don't have to. <laughs> so, like, one thing I found that helps a lot is 
um, when you're going shopping, actually carrying, which some people do or don't. If you're carrying, carry yeah. while you're shopping for clothes, see how it works. Uh, everybody's different. Everybody has different. Um, I would say that they put different priorities on their their defense support system, right? So some people may want to, I'm going into downtown, so I need to carry, or you have the people who are adamant about carrying every day. And then you're going to have the people who are going to dress around the gun because they're secure, having what they consider to be the right tool for the job, um, may be more important to them than their fashion. So I don't think that there's really a right answer whatsoever. I kind of fall somewhere in the middle personally. I'm not willing to give up carrying, um, a good solid firearm and a good solid holster for fashion's sake. But at the same time, I don't want to dress like my boyfriend. <laughs> so um, there's, there's definitely an in-between there, but I think that it really comes down to what people value period. Like, what do you, yeah. what do you value? What do you think? Yeah. yeah. The bringing the gun to the dressing room is a good tip. I've done that a couple of times and um, yeah, that's a good tip. Yeah, yeah fact, I do that every the, time. It's that's one of the reasons really I don't try on clothes. Nope, I have a gun on. No. Oh, really? It, well, it because my wife always wants me to try stuff on. No, can't. Sorry, <laughs> carrying a gun. No. I mean, the thing she is, you only have to that. do it. You don't have to do it for so long. Like I've been carrying the same gun for so many years that I don't have to try it on anymore. But you know, getting at least building that um, understanding and a pattern of what kind of clothes you buy helps. Oh, it's just my way of getting out of trying on clothes. <laughs> I hate trying on clothes. I don't blame you. Okay, so we talked about some of the different options. Are there any options that have stuck out for you that did not work as far as carrying? Whether it be a specific type of holster or an area... Yeah, Either wearing a <laughs> wearing a inside the waistband holster with a suit on. <laughs> okay, that was a challenge. <laughs> um, well, and women's suits are a little sh more sheer and light than, um, like my jeans, for example. So, yeah, I had a real dilemma with that one, and that was one where I ended up wearing those. Um, I did. I, I do have those shorts with the sewn-in holsters. And, mm -hmm. um, it disappeared once I wore that and I tucked in my shirt around uh, over it. You, you couldn't even tell. Yeah. In that instance, I also wear those, those same shorts. It's like the, I don't remember what they're called. Under tech shorts. Yeah. With the sewn in holster. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found that or like under a dress, like very yeah. good. Yeah. I really like those shorts. I think AC Undercover also makes a pair of shorts um, with the holsters in them for half the price of Undertech Undercover. I haven't tried those yet. I've just I just have the Undertech Undercover ones. See, and this is another aspect that men probably don't need to worry about. I can get away with appendix ninety percent of the time. I don't have to worry about other types of clothes. And yeah, you guys have kind of kind of more difficult for you guys. Yeah, no, we have a very diverse wardrobe, so it. And, a, you know, very diverse, like a very diverse pair, uh, array of shoes. <laughs> so you, you dress for the occasion and then you got to figure out where to put the gun. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of which, how often is that something that you take in consideration when you're dressing up? The location you're going to be carrying a firearm are one type of shoe better than the other? Shoes? Yeah. Okay. So here's my example. For me, I'm completely utilitarian, so I can I don't need to worry about hell anything as far as my, my footwear is concerned. I can go off on a trail or do anything like that. However, my wife, she's wearing high heels sometimes. She's wearing this and that and the other. How often is that something that you have to consider when you're carrying a firearm? Um, I've worn heels, taken heels to the range. I've shot in all of my shoes, but that's cool. I don't think that it doesn't, it doesn't make a huge impact. Obviously some shoes are going to be better for different applications, but 
you know. No, yeah. but the fact that you, you went with to the range to shoot in various different types, that's just cool. Yeah. Also looks kind of funny when you're like switching out your shoes, but <laughs> So what is your main, what is your favorite means of carrying them for either of you? What's most comfortable and most effective? Waste I wear, paint. yeah, yeah, I do a four o'clock tenacore holster. That's my favorite. I also really like the five shot leather for the inside the waistband. And it's the same every day, no matter what I'm wearing, if I'm carrying, that's where I'm carrying Namia? Yep. And so the waistband and every once in a while on the small on my back, every time I post a picture of me carrying the small on my back, I get comments about, well, what if you fall on your back? So, well, you know, what if a meteor falls on my head? I mean, I, I have it on me and I know I can reach it and I know, you know how to draw it. And I practiced it that way. Every once in a while, I'll wear a garter holster when I'm wearing a, a full a dress or a skirt. Um, it's okay, but um, I prefer waistband. So with most likely the majority of our audience being male, how would you suggest they go about introducing firearms to their significant other? My suggestion. Like a... Oh, go ahead, Mia. Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I hate to sound like a lawyer, but it depends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, it does. It does. But I think the more ideas that we can throw out, the better. So and maybe something will stick. I, I guess I, I kind of have to turn this conversation around a little bit um, because we could have this exact same conversation about anybody. So like, even if you have a guy friend who you want to get into shooting or it's a chick who's a shooter and she wants to get her boyfriend into it, whatever. Um, at the end of the day, it's, if there's no interest there, pushing too hard is not going to be helpful. There are plenty of other, if you're worried about security, there are plenty of other options out there that may not be as awesome as shooting a gun, but that can maybe even segue into that mindset, right? If you develop that mindset first, the whole gun thing could come later. So for, for people who are not, you know, I've got sisters who don't shoot and I care about them and love them deeply and wish they would and wish they would carry, but I'd never ride them about it. They know where they can find me if they want to shoot. In the meantime, I give them pepper spray. I give them or try to get them hooked up with pepper spray classes, knife classes, et cetera. They're, they do martial arts, whatever they want to do. But security is a mindset. And I don't think that a gun is the only answer to that. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I, my wife should shoot because I'm worried about her safety. And I get it. Like, I totally get it because I'm on that same page. But not everybody else is, you know, so if they don't want to do it. There's really no way to make them do it. Yeah, it's just a tool. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. It's like, what tool are you going to use to get the job done? I think working on mindset and building that together, especially if you're in a relationship, is you'll probably eventually end up going down that road anyways. Cool. Mia? Yeah, it, it definitely is. A, it's a mindset thing. And it, you want it to become a part of their lifestyle as well. So um, whether uh, there's women who aren't, who aren't ready to carry a gun, I mean, even if they learn how to shoot, they're just not ready to carry a gun. Um, but you want to get them in that frame of mind of, you know, what if, what if I'm in a situation where I have to protect myself or protect my children? You want to, you don't want to spook them and, you know, think you're going to get raped and everyone's going to get murdered and blah, blah, blah. But you want to just have them and at least have some sort of plan in mind. Um, one, and because a lot of it is actually instinctual in them and it's just a matter of kind of cultivating that when we had our, in our beginners class, Mike does this lunchtime talk with the women and he kind of reminds them of what they already know, but bringing it to the forefront and telling them, you know, for centuries, women have been left behind to take care of the homestead. The Vikings go off, the samurais go off, the cowboy, you know, the, the ranch herders go off. Who's left to protect the home and the kids? It's the women. And they, there's no 911. They've got to learn how to use a gun or use a weapon to protect themselves. Um, and just be ready. You don't go out looking for trouble, but you're just ready for it when it comes. 
Um, so once they're, you know, what, once they kind of think along those lines and it becomes sort of, they sort of weave it into everything that they do, you know, whether it's be aware of your surroundings or I have something in my purse, whatever it may be, um, or just have, you know, an emergency plan ready or have a, a plan ready if someone breaks into our home. And just kind of give you an example. I had a girlfriend who um, I always I jokingly tell people if I was ever in a bar fight, I'd want this girl on my side because she's just this scrappy, like super tough chick. And um, she was caught by surprise one night because her husband who worked on those oil rigs out in the ocean came home early and didn't tell her. So she hears someone coming into her home at three in the morning and she freaked out and she, she said she froze. She wanted to scream to her little boys to run. She wanted to find something sharp and attack the guy, but she just froze because she was frightened and she was kicking her. Luckily, you know, it was her husband, but she was kicking herself afterwards and beating herself up thinking, what if that was a real intruder? You know, I, I, we all would have been dead. I said, Hey, don't worry about it. It's just because you didn't have a plan. You never thought about what was going to, you know, what you would do if something like that happened. And I guarantee you next time you won't be frozen because you'll know exactly what you're going to do once that adrenaline starts kicking in. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of, of getting them thinking along those lines. And the women that were dragged to our classes, they were the ones who never wanted to touch their husband's guns. They didn't want anything to do with it. They, you know, no interest whatsoever. And there was one guy who um, emailed me later and he said, I, uh, what have you done with my wife? She was this woman who had, she didn't want to look at my guns. And I had to drag her to your class. I paid for the class. I said, you have to go. I loaded all her mags and everything. I bought her a holster. I made her go. I drove her over there. I told her, you're not leaving because I'm the only, you're only right back home. And um, we drive home and I'm, he said, I'm normally the one who takes the gun out of the, the lock safe in the car because they have a little lock box thing. And I take it in the house and I unload it and I put it in the safe. Um, well, we get out of the car. I start pulling the gun out of the lock box and she stops me and she says, I got this. She takes the gun from me. I follow her in the house and I see her manipulating this gun. She, you know, takes out the mag, she just locks the slide back and, 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 you know, checks it and, I didn't even know who I was looking at anymore. And, and, but she, she said, I can't, she completely, her attitude towards guns had completely changed. It wasn't this foreign, mysterious object of violence and gore. It was now a tool she knew how to use if the time came. It did, she didn't have to be obsessed with it. She didn't have to, you know, um, take it out every day, but she had that kind of peace of mind and now, um, comfort knowing I know what to do with that thing. And if someone breaks in, I'm, I can handle that gun better than the guy who's breaking in my house. That's cool. Any tips on how to help develop that, that mindset? Yeah, there is an instinctual, especially with my wife and uh, instinctual defensive defend the cub. Mm -hmm. Anything, anything further, any resources that you guys have used to help further develop that? especially in today's modern society. Yeah, there's more and more, um, whether you, you know, it's blogs or Instagram pages, social media or guntress classes <laughs> that, um, that talk about it. You know, it's, it's, there's more dialogue about it, I think. You see more women, you know, with firearms that aren't just showing their boobs. They actually know how to use the gun, for example. And I think just reinforcing kind of that, the positive image and the positive dialogue that's more female friendly, you know, dialogue that's relevant to them and their particular lifestyle and their particular needs. Um, I think that's what will get them listening more and thinking more about that topic. They're not going to be necessarily interested in a dialogue about plate carriers or, you know, no. scopes and optics and things like that, which is. Oh, maybe in time. I hope. Yeah. Hopefully eventually. <laughs> But to get, you need to get them, you need to ha expose them to, th to items or topics or uses that are relevant to them because they're just like a fitness routine or a diet. They need to be able to weave it into their day to day. You know, and it's funny that you said that because that's pretty much what, well, probably about 95% of the gun enthusiast population probably should just be focusing on that anyway and not focusing on plate carriers and stuff because there's no practical purpose or no practical application right 
<laughs> Except everyone needs them all. <laughs> yes. Everyone does need them all. Yes. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I think uh, it really just comes down to that, that mindset conversation. And, you know, I, I assume that everybody here who's, you know, in the comments and stuff that want their girlfriends and their wives to shoot with them, like, everybody spends enough time with their significant other, hopefully, that they have these conversations about things and things will come up. Or if you want to start that conversation, you can start that conversation. Probably the least creepy way to start that is like in a movie when something happens, look over and be like, oh my gosh, what would you do? If that was us, you know? Preferably not or if that were you and the kids. That's rude. Right, that's rude. But like, <laughs> rather than just like driving down the road and be like, what would you do if you were at the mall and someone started shooting? Like, that may not be like the best approach, right? But like get, having those mindset conversations and getting on the same page. And then there's the other fact that the other person just may not be into that and i'm not saying that that should change your relationship but looking for compatibility in that area is definitely something um if you're single that you should be doing if you want a relationship that involves that and isn't your boyfriend a bit of a gun guy too <laughs> a bit of a gun guy <laughs> yes um he is a instructor for Insights Training Center. He does some executive protection uh, instructing as well. And um, he is super into guns and cars and motorcycles. <laughs> but that's what brought us together was the guns. Yeah. I was told once, um, as far as dealing with a significant other, if you have a background in firearms, you still may want to have a third party provide any type of instruction yes. and leave it to them. Okay. Yes. Let's, let's get into that. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've heard, I can't teach my wife or I can't teach my significant other. We always end up fighting. She won't listen to me. She, you know, she's always arguing with me. It's just the dynamic between two people. And it's not, you know, I'm not going to say that's across the board. You do have, some couples that, you know, can teach each other, but the majority of them, whatever it is, um, it's just, it, you know, it, there's friction. So um, that's why we get a lot of, <laughs> I'd say about 50% of my referrals as far as clients come from um, the significant others who have already trained with Mike. And um, uh, they sign up their, it's kind of like they throw their, their women at us and say, please teach her. <laughs> And, um, and yeah, the women are far more receptive to Mike and I than they would be to their husbands, not because they, they don't trust their husbands. They just, it's just that dynamic. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Like your, your family or significant others should not be teaching you how to shoot. On that note, I want to take this like opportunity to give a huge shout out to my boyfriend, Ray Porthen, because I am a huge believer in not shooting with your significant other or learning from them. But since I've worked with him, my shooting has like advanced huge. I have progressed massively, like huge. So I will say that aside, don't train with your significant other. So you <laughs> kind of blurred his name. I know it. what his name is. You should probably enunciate it a little better. Ray Porthen. Okay, good. Because you know he's just listening and, and waiting to hear his name. I don't know if he's actually listening. No, probably not. No one is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, um, Grace, that's actually what you say is true. We have the, the husband send um, their significant others to us. And then it is almost always followed up by, are you guys going to have a couples class? Because once, now that their, their significant other is pretty adept with a firearm, they want to shoot together. And that's the other interesting thing that I've noticed is um, they are so intent upon their wife or girlfriend or, you know, whoever it is to, to learn how to shoot. Once they realize, okay, she's kind of now into it, they want to keep encouraging it. And they don't care how much she's going to spend <laughs> on yeah. guns and ammo and gear. <laughs> so it works out just great. <laughs> but they want to train together. They want a couples class. They want to do those drills and everything together. And um, I think it's great. I think it's a great way to grow as a, 
to grow as a couple or to grow as, you know, partners and, um, and learn alongside each other. Mm-hmm. I don't know. To, to me, it makes a lot of sense, especially if both sides of the couple are on the same page. If something happens, they both know how to respond. They know how to react. They are on the same page for the plan. And they equally would be able to hopefully um, defend as necessary. Yeah, they don't have to worry about each other. Like he knows yeah. she's got it. She knows he's got it. Or you just argue over who does have it. <laughs> get yeah. the rifle. No, I get the rifle, damn it. <laughs> you take the shotgun. You call 911. <laughs> okay, we both go. <laughs> okay, what about couples room clearing classes? That's what we need. <laughs> Yes. Sports. What would my daughter do then? Carry ammo. I don't know. <laughs> Get, put a rifle in her hands. Sure. You can do family she, room clearing. She, she's got our six. <laughs> yeah. She's, she's yeah. gonna hold, she's gonna hold the hallway while we enter the room. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Okay. I'll I'll I'm gonna present this for you guys to, to churn for a second. Um, one of your favorite, maybe even cringe worthy or funny stories that you've had to deal with other people, ignorant people, and you being a firearms person. Mm. Think of something for a second. Unfortunately, I have to throw something at me to, to immediately answer. Tell me about that holster that you have. Which one? The one with the... Dang it, what's the name of the, the special clip? The ulti clip? Yes. Oh, are you talking about the um what do we call it? <laughs> the, the with the trigger guard. Yeah. Just the trigger guard and the ulti clip, right? Yeah. The the uh Vanguard 2. Yes. With the clip. The G2. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um I it kind of came up as um the result of a complaint I had, which is, you know, I, I carry a Glock 19. It's not a light gun. It's not a necessarily skinny gun. And um, I said, if I could just find the most minimalist holster out there that can still do the job, um, but like not add anything to my gun, that'd be perfect. And Mike said, well, you know, they had this trigger guard holster that um, we can snap on. I said, yeah, but I don't always wear a belt. That's the problem. That one comes with a loop. And so then um, I forgot who said it. There's an ulti clip, an ulti clip attachment. So we're like, why don't we try that? See how it works. So made some phone calls, got the parts, put it together. And um, yeah, it caught on the whole, you know, you just, you, you, some people just don't want all that extra. There's some real gimmicky holsters out there that put a lot of bells yeah. and whistles on there. Kydex and we figured well what if we went the other way <laughs> and took yeah. away every possible added element except for what you absolutely need um, maybe you don't wear a belt you know maybe you uh, need to um, um, clip it onto something other than your waistband I don't know so yeah we we, um, we I think we have a few left but we sold most of them and um, both to men and women who were looking for um, a holster where they didn't need a belt, but they still needed wanted to carry a bigger gun. So it's the best of both and worlds. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Vanguard 2. Well, the Vanguard 3 too, as well, but Vanguard 2 is an awesome low-profile little tiny footprint option. Yes. And then to throw that, that clip on there, that just makes sense. A lot more functionality. Yes. Yeah. I love it. I have to be careful not to lose it because I have a little holster drawer and it gets lost in there because it's so small. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually that brings me to a thought. I have been wanting to start like um, a thrift store for, because everybody has a giant box of old holsters, right? Everybody has that. They don't throw away because for some reason it's like sacrilegious to throw away all your old safari lands uncle mike's what the heck ever you've got i think what somebody should do this i'm probably not going to do it i don't have the energy to but somebody should start a like goodwill for gun stuff and like there'll be little ziploc baggies with the belt loops for holsters random rounds of ammo etc everybody has a ton of gear this should happen i call that the box of bad ideas because if it's in a box and i haven't used it it was a bad idea 
Exactly. It, so everybody has a, a good thought idea. To them. Yeah, it could be a good idea for somebody else. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hit all the people who haven't figured out yet that that stuff's no good. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can. I don't. I couldn't do that with a clear conscience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But everybody needs their them. box. So everybody has a box, and everybody has to go through the same process that we did, right? So why not? We could. You know, all the proceeds could go to a good cause, right? Yeah. Mm. No, no, still a bad idea. I would feel bad about it. That's as a matter of fact, that's kind of contrary to everything that I'm doing in the primary and secondary, okay. trying to help it so people don't have to make the same mistakes. That's a good kinda, point. Yeah. But it's hey, gotta be somebody who you. wants to use it for something now, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it could be a holster that maybe didn't work for you, but it would work for somebody else. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I think that there's everybody's got a ton of those too. So. And then also but, people that got rid of a, a handgun and they still have the holster. Right. Yep. But yeah, Serpas, no, oh. we're not going to. No. <laughs> oh, no. Those aren't allowed. No. No. And there are a couple other brands, but I'll just leave it at that. So how often have you guys been offered a snub nose? From someone who doesn't know any better, or you go into a, go to a gun store, and then the clerk is like, "Here, this is a good choice for you." <laughs> you know, back in like I want to say 2010, 11, 12, that was a lot more prevalent for me. That was like every time I walked into a gun store. But I think, at least here in Washington State, people are doing a lot better about that. I have not had that come up in years. And I talk, I ask my students all the time if they've had that issue. And for the most part, they haven't. So the good news is good job gun people on the internet for educating everybody, because that has absolutely people like you, Matt, like pretty much gotten rid of that. So I still see it. Really? Uh, maybe it, maybe I have some kind of special radar that picks up on that kind of crap, but yeah, it's still there. Yeah. I'm also in like a more progressive coastal state maybe i was gonna say i think it's a generational thing to be honest mm. um, and i am old, i, I so. get it <laughs> no i mean you have you have those guys that are you know they swear by the 1911s they swear by the revolvers and usually those are the guys that tend to offer you know the the little revolvers or little pink revolvers the younger guys not so much um and i think it has a lot to do with um, they're just there's just this increase now in the industry of, you know, be aware that there are women that are wanting to come in and learning to shoot, and the the demographic is growing, and um, you know they should be treated just as fairly. And so it's I think it's a generational thing where either it's the younger guys or the guys who are just more um, with it, so to speak, to put it colloquially, that um, understand that revolvers aren't for women and plus they don't like well, revolvers could. so why <laughs> why would they pass it off to somebody else yeah so let, let's dispel that why is a snub nose revolver a bad choice or potentially bad choice for a any first time shooter or a shooter who is a bit weaker than another small lightweight more perceived recoil Shorter sight radius. Um, that's pretty much my sums it up as best as I can. Um, I see, and I've seen full grown men not enjoy shooting those. For a more advanced shooter or intermediate to advanced, cool, awesome. You want to shoot that? Good for you. Um, but starting on it, it's just, it's a lot to handle. It has a lot of muzzle flash, which for some people who may already be scared in the first place, isn't helpful. Received recoil, et cetera. I can tell you the comments that I've heard from women who fired that gun. It hurts my hand. Um, I don't know how to, you know, how to operate, like how to operate it. It doesn't make sense to them. And um, it's heavy. <laughs> and there, some of them have had heavy ones because um, they were told, oh, it's better for you. Um, but they said, it just says, it doesn't feel good in my hand is it's probably the most common comment I've heard. One of the things that I used to hear all the time, why they should have a revolver is because, you know, the, those females, they don't have the strength to rack back the slide. 
Well, do they have <laughs> the individual finger strength to do that 12 pound trigger? Yeah. 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 Um, Mike does a pile test in our classes where the first half of our class, he has them disassemble and reassemble um, all their firearms. And then he swaps the guns around and has them do it again. And then, um, then he takes a, a, three different guns, takes them all apart, puts them all in one pile and gives them to a woman and says, make me three guns. And by the end of it, before we even fire one shot on the range, they know those guns so well, how they work, how to manipulate them that they don't even think about, you know, fumbling with it or, or anything else. So, and it, it helps with their confidence level with the gun as well, but um, just handling it and, and, you know, watch, you know, locking the slide back and releasing it, looking at all the springs and seeing how it all fits together like a bunch of Legos is huge. Yeah. You know, that, that works really well also with what you said at the beginning with your misconceptions of what firearms were, they'd be scary and all that. And then to take it apart, put it back together and see, yeah, this, this makes sense how it works. Then they right. shoot it and realize, yeah, this is kind of fun. Yeah. They're like Jane Wick by the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Look what I can do. <laughs> Honestly, that sounds like something that would be great for any class in, of beginners to do, not just the ladies. Like that seems like it'd be hugely beneficial. Yeah. It demystifies the gun. Yeah. So why is there a... Uh, separation between male and female as far as guns are concerned why 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 do males seem to think that women need to be different that's a great question matt that is the exact same question i've been having i yeah. now i can definitely see as far as my wife is concerned having a little bit more of a welcome atmosphere and not, not being uh, full of all these SWAT guys or whatever in a class. I can definitely see that. Oh, you mean specifically in a class? Oh, I mean, I mean overall. Overall. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think there's well, just I, been this. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, Mia. You're, you're way further. I, I was just, there's been this like kind of a culture developed around the gun. You know, the, uh, and nowadays it's, grow beard, wear camo, and, you know, wear these t-shirts with these particular mottos and slogans on them. <laughs> and it really has nothing to do with whether or not you can shoot or whether or not you can handle the gun. And yet there's this whole surrounding culture around it, you know, be aggro and Valhalla and blah, 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 blah. Yep. Um, and so, you know, and that's the only thing out there right now. Uh, and then you look at what's out there for females and, it's not as appealing. <laughs> well, so, also, there's so much representation by a gun bunny type versus real shooters. Right. And again, it has nothing to do with whether or not you can handle a firearm or whether or not you can shoot. So I've, I can't, I've had women who, and my own friends who, um, you know, look at the magazines that I'm looking at or look at the images that I'm looking at and they'll give me this look and say, is that, is that how they market? I can't show this to my friends. They'll laugh at me. I said, yeah, I know. I know. That's why I don't show it to people. <laughs> yeah. But it's, there's nothing that they can relate to. So in, so in their minds, oh, if that's what it's all about, then it's not for me. It's for men who look like that, who talk like that, who act like that. It's for women who dress who like that to. or who look like that. And I have women who are, you know, they're professionals. They're, um, and yeah, no, they don't look like gun bunnies, but they're extremely intelligent. They're ex you know, extremely curious. They have the aptitude, but there's no one that looks like them um, in the gun industry right now. So then you just sort of have this artificial separation between your everyday woman and um, the men who are just glorifying the whole gun and violence and everything. And um, the women who, honestly, I don't know what they're doing there other than to pose at the gun and have everyone look at their, their body. So it's just, there's just sort of this, I think it's a lot of self-indulgence with the people who are in there trying to market themselves to look cool or whatnot, but it ends up alienating other people because then they think, well, then if that's what it's supposed to, especially people who are new to the whole gun industry, if they think if that's what it's all about, then I have no place there. 
And based on what you described, it, for me, it's something that I've been yelling about, and it's flash versus substance and appearances versus reality. There are some some companies that I'm in contact with that I'm urging them, please stop with endorsing this gun bunny thing. Let's go with actual shooters, people that know what they're talking about, people that you would be proud of to have represent you. Right. Or focus more on the skill rather yeah. than how cool it looks. Yeah. And I think that there are some companies that are doing a really good job of that. Um, you see like Smith and Wesson, you know, Julie Gold. she is a huge inspiration for women. She's normal. She's not a gun bunny. She is all around like an amazing, powerful woman who can mom just as hard as she can shoot and she can outshoot the boys any day of the year, you know? So, and there are lots of female, I would say the competition realm is where you're going to see more of the competent um, females actually being showcased. But um, in general, I think that shooting is the one sport where, in my opinion anyways, one of the very few sports, I won't say the one, but one of the fewer sports where it your gender doesn't actually play an effect at all in your strength and ability to do the sport. So unlike maybe more physical sports where like, let's, let's face it, factually speaking, not all the time, but most of the time men are stronger than women. Okay. Just with shooting, it's not that way. You can get, you get, um, Jerry Michalik, who's much older than some of these other shooters out there. I'm trying to say that as respectfully as possible because he's amazing. Um, but he is still out shooting 99% of the shooters out there. And you get people who are um, not as fit as others and they're still performing. So the idea that, that we separate the men from the women when it comes to competition or training or whatever I think that it needs to be done very carefully because I don't think that segregation sheds the light that there, that this is a sport that actually is all about technically equality. I'm not sitting here trying to be a feminist. I'm like, this is legitimate equality. Yeah. Everybody has an equal chance to put as much effort as they want into it and get the same results, you know? So I, that's way, unfortunately marketing in the gun industry hasn't 100% caught up with that you know you'll get some of these magazines they're absolutely marketing to the men but the men are still technically the majority so they're trying to get those sales is it right no but it is changing slowly it yeah i agree um because i think historically the gun industry was targeting specialized occupations like law enforcement like military and there's a lot of men in those particular occupations. And now you see this shift, especially at this year's SHOT Show, a big shift towards concealed carry weapons because um, that is probably the biggest key to marketing towards women. Everyday women who um, they may not have the time to do sports shooting. They may not have the time to go shoot an AR, but they do have the time to carry a, a small enough gun on them to protect themselves and to protect their kids. So um, I think if you see more of that and you see, uh, you, you're going to have a, a greater appeal towards um, everyday women out there who um, are, they have the interest. They want to learn how to shoot. They want to, because they want to learn how to protect themselves. And if you can find a product and, and find a way to market to them um, that, that allows them to feel like they can plug into this industry and they can find something that they can relate to. I think that that's going to, um, you're going to see, that's where you're going to see the expansion in the gun industry and how they market. And it's my understanding that uh, there are more and more females getting into shooting. It's a, it's a untapped resource for, for sales. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, and I gotta so, say, so. you have to look at like the DIY industry, the, the, um, even the food industry, the kitchens used to be the chefs. It still kind of is, but it's a very male dominated industry. You look at, you know, HGTV and home, the, the um, all those home makeover shows, all that contractor work and all the, all that renovation work that used to be a male dominated industry. And now it's, 
it's led by women. You see women in those shows, you see, you know, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's marketing towards women. They have <clears throat> DIY classes marketed towards women because they recognize the spending power and the purchase power of these particular yep. women. They're the primary purchasing agents of their households. They're the ones who primarily decide, you know, where that budget's going to go. So those industries were transformed by women who were interested in doing those particular activities that were traditionally just male oriented. The beer industry calls uh, women the Holy Grail because look at the wine industry. Now you associate wine with women, you know, who love to make it a part of a, a weekend getaway in wineries and the whole wine image and the whole wine marketing image is more geared towards women than it is men. And that used to be a male dominated industry. And that's, I think, where the gun industry is going to be headed eventually. Yeah, it sounds like the industry just needs to take females seriously and yes. not be insulting with with advertising and with what they're using as, uh, dare I say, props. Right. Yeah. It's a matter of making it accessible. Yeah. So no more Taurus Curve. <laughs> I just had to bring that up. Someone said it. <laughs> and uh, one of you mentioned uh, Julie, and isn't she running for NRA for the? Uh, she, yeah. Yeah, she is. Julie is an amazing woman, and um, she is most certainly running for NRA. I don't. I don't remember if it's like board of directors or what. I think that's but what it was same yeah. with uh, Dwayne, Dwayne Liptak, and uh, mm -hmm. Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. Very cool. Okay. Anyone have a funny story yet or a cringe worthy story? Oh yeah. Uh. <laughs> I worked at a range for like 10 years. <laughs> I have a lot of, a lot of cringe worthy stories, but I also don't like to tell stories about my students. <sighs> so it's not like you have an NDA or anything. No. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant cringeworthy stories about us. Oh, it's stuff that you've encountered, whether it be oh, you okay. or, or someone else. Or someone else. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'll give you a second to think. I'll take another drink of this fine beverage. <laughs> I know for us, for guys, uh, picking out a belt is, well, it's kind of important because that's what holds our pants up and our guns. Is it any different with, with females? Is like a mean jean or a, like a mean jean victory aegis or a Aries gear vic or aegis something that you consider? Or is there something special due to your body types? I think everybody's different. I really like the... Um the buckles on those, uh, the Aries gear belts and stuff for me, just because it stays on my, but the belt stays on my pants. And then there's that uncomfortable topic of what do you do when you go to the bathroom? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that keeps everything like where it needs to be. So if I'm going to the range to like shoot or going to a class or something like that, I've always got a belt on with one of those, uh, clips because it's a huge or buckles. It's a huge difference for me. Yeah. Yeah. The bathroom I, dilemma. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's struggles yeah real. I, again, as someone who has no frame of reference with what you go through, I'm all about the function. So I could care less about fashion or appearances. And that's something my wife is really trying to change me with, but <laughs> So then that's something I need to consider when we discuss firearm stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Story time. Anyone? Well, I have had, I guess this is like more of a generality because this is, was pretty common, but uh, I would have people call or come in multiple times with like an issue with their gun and they'd come up to me and they'd be like, Hey, is there anybody who works here? And I, I'd be like, yeah, I do. Like, okay. Um, is there a man available? Like that's like <laughs> a very standard question. And there've been multiple times I just said, no, what's your problem? And I fixed it for them and embarrassed them. Um, but that's probably the most cringeworthy is just, oh, no, no, no. 
I got it. I got one. So this guy calls and he goes, Hey, do you guys offer women's only gun classes? I go, I, I told him, I was like, you know, we don't offer women's only gun classes right now. All of our classes are co-ed. However, over 50% of all of our classes are women. Like most of my classes were at least 50% women. And uh, he goes on to tell me that he doesn't want her in a classroom with other men. And I asked him if he thought it was because she would feel uncomfortable. And he goes, no, I'm uncomfortable with it. I just don't want her shooting with other men. I want her around other men. And that kind of put a really bitter taste in my mouth for um, these women who are really pushed into classes by their significant others. I'm sitting there thinking like, this was if that was his right? wife, how I would feel. Right? What? No, this was in the 50s, right? When this happened? Right, right. It was in the 50s. Yeah, it was. Well, what am I like 80 years old now? So that's <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> but I mean, for me, that was very, it's not funny. It was just very cringeworthy. Like I'm bizarre. Yeah, I was, I was actually shocked. And um, I tried to talk to him a little bit, but I decided that I didn't want to take his money if he's forcing his wife to take my class anyways. So That's unfortunate. Yeah, that was cringeworthy. And and uh, speaking of which, a uh, big shout out to Ray. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Anything my you? yeah. I was just thinking. I think my worst experience was the one I already shared, which is when I went to my to get my permit, my concealed carry permit, and the way the instructor singled me out and you know asked me questions about you know do I hit what I aim at and, you know, how many times have I shot and, um, and things like that. And there's no, you know, you just to sit there and have to take it, so to speak. But I know like in the back of my mind, I know at some point I'm going to have to shoot. And that's really the only way I can show <laughs> that I know what I'm doing because, um, I could tell him all I want that I can, I'm, I can handle my gun and I can handle it pretty well. It's not until I get out on the range and I start firing that he'll shut up. So mm -hmm. until then, um, I just have to <laughs> listen to him, question me and save it for a funny story later. So who have been your favorite instructors to work with and why? To and I train. think I know what Mia's going to say. I <laughs> firearm instruction. Um, would this be to like work alongside or take classes from also? Take classes from. I really, really enjoy Frank Proctor. Mm. His classes are super fun. He's super chill. Um, I really enjoyed that class. Also, I routinely take the Insights classes, Insights Training Center classes quite a bit because those are where I see exponential growth for my skills. I also heard from a friend that uh, you're quite a... a, a very good instructor yourself as well. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to drop any names or anything, but I was told, yeah, she does a really good class. Oh, so that's, thank that's cool. you. Yeah. Mia, your favorites? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, who else? Have, okay, let's, yeah, let's talk about him, but uh, who else as well? well I've t I've, I go to different ranges in Southern California. Um, and uh, it's nice to sometimes just be a student, not be a, an instructor, because you can relax a little bit and you see how others do it. Um, and you see a lot of similarities, like consistencies between different instructors, and then you see their quirks. Yeah. And um, um, I, I mean, they're, yeah, I, I, I couldn't really remember their names really now off the top of my head, but I, I do go to various ranges, especially if they have a women's club. I'm always interested in checking out to see how they run their women's club and how they run their women's classes and, you know, talk to the women in those classes and see, you know, are, what do they think or how do they learn or you know, why are they learning how to shoot? But um, I, it's, sometimes it's the unknowns that um, you can learn a lot from. You just never know where you're going to pick up, pick up a pearl of wisdom here and there. Yeah. Speaking of what you said about uh, it's nice to be the student. Absolutely. Uh, doing the law enforcement instruction thing as a, yeah, as a cop instructor in firearms, you really get a shoot and you always have to be 
I wouldn't say on guard, but always yeah. looking out and constantly, right. constantly working. And you don't get it. You don't get that nice range time that everyone else does. And to be able to switch that around and attend someone else's class is so nice. It's kind of like being on a podcast on someone else's podcast. I can relax <laughs> and just talk as opposed to doing 12 yeah. other things simultaneously. <laughs> cool. So let's see here. So what exactly is uh, Mike's involvement with your company? Okay. So and we're talking about Mike Pannone for those of you yes. that are just joining. Mike Pannone of CTT Solutions. And he, he still has, obviously, he still has CTT Solutions. He's basically the chief instructor um, for Guntrist. And um, he runs the classes. He's, he's, he teaches the classes. And I, I help out. And sometimes we have an, another body also help out as well. Um, we cap the basic classes at 10 bodies. And then oh, cool. um, the intermediate classes or, or other classes, we, we can accommodate more. But he comes up with the curriculum. Um, we talk about um, different new things to bring up. Or I tell him about, you know, what the women would like or, you know, I, what I would like to see that we could offer to the women. Uh, we want to bring in some munitions, for example, to um, the more advanced shooters. And um, uh, and it's sort of, I have my ear to the ground because he's taking the lead So, in, as far as instruction goes. And I kind of stand behind the group and I talk to the women. And, um, and then in that way, I can feed him the feedback of what they thought or how they reacted to a particular thing that he said, or a particular thing that he taught, or um, it gives us ideas as to, you know, where we should take the next class, or uh, um, the afternoon. Maybe, you know, we had a plan for the afternoon, and we decided we're going to change it up a little bit based on what we're hearing or what we're seeing in the class. So, um, I guess the short answer is he's the chief instructor for Guntrist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how long have you guys been working together? few years now um at least i'm gonna say about three years Around one of there. the highlights cool uh well, we, one of the highlights from last year's shot was roaming around with bill blowers and running into mike in person for the first time and just a great guy to talk to just really enjoyed the conversation we had um just yeah genuinely just a good guy he's a very down-to-earth guy for the accomplishments that he's, <laughs> you know, he's accomplished in his and lifetime, what he's been through. and what he's been through, yeah, it's amazing. He, and but at the end of the day, he's still he's such a down to earth guy. And like I said, the women have no idea who he is, but they have all said the same thing. He he breaks things down so well. He explains things so well. He's so nice. He's so approachable. And um, the guys, I've had actually a few guys tell me I would never send my woman to another class other than Mike's because I know that basically he's not a slime bag. He's not going to try to yeah. hit on her. He's not going to try to get in her pants um, yeah. because I, I don't trust my, my wife or my girlfriend with anybody else. Um, yeah. So that was, that was kind of an interesting comment that we got sometimes. Yeah. That sounds like an awesome partnership. Yeah. He's in, he's intense sometimes, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> why would that be? How often do any of the students want to find out more about him? How often do they how, want to like find how, Yeah. How often does he have like story time between uh, on breaks? Oh, like when we're loading mags or, we're, or you know, we're there, there's, there's lulls and, um, and it's weird. He'll, Bring up, he'll bring up these stories about his past that, to him, it's like he's telling them about what he picked up at the grocery store the other day. It's, it's, it's so nonchalant, but he's talking about, you know, just these, they sound like straight out of Hollywood stories. And then he'll change the subject and talk about his daughter or something. And the women are standing there with their mouths hanging open going, did that really happen? <laughs> And then, you know, and, and, his, and that's what I mean. He's so down to earth. He doesn't see it. To him, it was a job, what he used to do. It was just the job that he did. So he talks about it like it's a work story. He doesn't talk about it like it's a, I'm a badass, you know, to listen to what I used to do kind of a thing. Um, so there, he, it's, and in a way, it, it feeds them little bits of, of the kind of dangerous work he used to do. And um, I can see the women's faces going, 
what else did this guy do? <laughs> what else is he all about? I know, right? The most interesting man in the world. <laughs> So are there any topics that you guys would like to discuss? Are there any other questions from the... Um... Uh, I've been trying to keep track, but I've been more focused on the conversation. <laughs> I need an assistant or something, dang it. This doesn't pay <laughs> enough. Yeah, are there any subjects that you'd like to bring up um, in general? Because I've gone through all my questions. Any subjects? Any comments? Um, let's let's look at the comments here. Let's see if anybody has anything specific. So I know there's there's been a lot of talk going on about women's classes. Um, something somebody brought up a bra holster earlier. If we bring if we talk about that, we should probably also segue into purse carry. Um, very Great shortly, idea. I'm sure everybody's on the same page on that, but this is a pretty, seems like a pretty good group of people. So everyone probably feels the same, but since we have a Mia here, we may as well, <laughs> right? But I'd be interested, Mia, to hear your thoughts on, um, because you do run women's only classes, like what are some of the, the pros and cons that you see there? Like the benefits are there any cons to having women's only classes? Yeah. Um, uh, I'd say the level of service is higher. Expectation of the level of service is higher. Um, mm -hmm. Because when I came up with a concept, you know, thinking to myself, what would my friends and I want, you know, if we were to have a women's only class? And it ended up being modeled after all the other little gatherings that we would have. So I have, I have a hostess table and I have like a, a, t a tub where we have sparkling water and, you know, different beverages and chocolates and snacks. And I do I this wherever there. we go. So I've actually shipped out food and tables and, um, you know, tablecloths out to the locations and set it up there. And the women graze and snack and, you know, take the little breaks. But it's what we're accustomed to. Whenever you gather, you have food, you have, you have comforts, little creature comforts. And I always call ahead and find out what the bathroom situation is at each range. Most of the time, it's porta potties And so I'll bring a little Lysol spray and hand sanitizer and, you know, and, and wet wipes. And tell the women, hey, this, this is all for you to use just to make yourself comfortable. Um, and so, but at the same time, you see the women start to bond very quickly because we're social creatures. So they all start chatting with one another and sharing stories. And, and um, afterwards, they always say, I never knew there were other women like me who also wanted to learn how to shoot guns. And to, for them to find those two common, you know, their moms or their, or their working professionals or whatever it may be. And on top of that, they want to learn how to shoot or they're there to learn how to shoot. To them, that was a combination they never would ever be able to find outside of the class or outside of that particular class. Um, so the upside was that you and these women would come back. They would they would we, they exchange numbers. They friend each other on Facebook or Instagram and then they come back together to a class. And um, <laughs> Mike once made the comment. Gosh, you women talk a lot and you ask a lot of questions. <laughs> so, and I, I told them, I said, yeah, you know, expect it. You know, we're, um, we do ask a lot of questions because we want to know, but I guarantee you they're going to remember everything that you said. And he said, yeah, sure enough, the amount of detail that they want to know and that they're able to retain is, is pretty amazing. And the best bathrooms I've ever seen at a range are at Alliance, just so you know. Seriously, they are like nice restaurant quality bathrooms. <laughs> and I've heard other people say the exact same thing, but it's true. And it's a really nice range too. And awesome staff. Bathrooms are important. I have a thing about bathrooms. <laughs> so it sounds like what you've set up is a much less of a, of a shock to their system. This will be Correct. easier to digest because they're comfortable. Yes. Um, as opposed to going out to, uh, to a field out in the middle of nowhere where there's, 
no one's ready. No one, no one's prepared. And it's just, yeah, just uncomfortable. Yeah. Like that, that all guys class that, that I, yeah. that, that first class that I went to where it was all guys. At one point I was getting hungry and I thought, when are we going to break for lunch? And these guys were standing around shoveling food in their mouths while they're loading their mags. And finally I said, are we going to stop for lunch at one certain point? They're like, no, we're eating while we're shooting. We don't, we don't stop. I said, Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll go know. eat and stand and shovel food in my mouth too. It wasn't very comfortable. And that's another thing. I make sure we take a break for lunch because we need to sit down and, you know, just take a break and eat and digest and then we'll get back to it. Yeah. It really sounds like what you've just described would be the type of thing that my wife would appreciate. And she'd probably be a little bit more willing to do that than go mm-hmm. to say one of the classes I'd want to go to. Right. Exactly. <laughs> What's, what do you mean? It's no fun just standing in the rain and the snow and the wind. Right. <laughs> Showing how tough I am. <laughs> That's right. And shivering to death. Grace, do you have something? Um, no, actually, I'm more, more or less just interested in hearing um, Mia's take on all of that, really. So that's really cool. I think that it'd be really beneficial probably for all beginners classes to to do that. And I know a lot of classes, at least up here in the Seattle area, people do do like coffee and donuts in the morning type of thing. But um, it's rainy, it's cold. If you're outside, we have some great indoor ranges too. But yeah, I think the, the creature comforts are really important for that first step in. And then after that, I think everybody just needs to man up and you're there to learn how to shoot guns. <laughs> Yeah, no, they do. Yeah, it's a matter of like getting them because they're in an environment that's foreign to them doing something that's foreign. And you're right. Well, after that first class, they don't really think about when they come back. They don't think about those um, that anymore. They're focused on what are we going to do next? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They actually want to roll around and get dirty. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They went out and bought like new 511 pants or something. (laughs) (laughs) With the knee pads. Right. (laughs) So is everybody, right yeah, yeah, are people talking about man purses? Is that still, is that still going on? <laughs> I don't think so. I didn't see that part. I, I think just saw someone a... sing. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. You saw someone sing. Oh, I was going to say something. Someone said something about uh, train how you fight. And I said, I eat how I fight. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't know That's what that means, good. but yeah. Oh yeah. So purse carry. You mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning if we have two female instructors on here. What's your take on purse carry, Mia? I, it's not for me personally. And um, because I have a very curious seven-year-old boy who gets into everything. And <laughs> yeah. um, he will most definitely find that gun and try to fire it. I guarantee, no matter what I tell him. He, he, <laughs> that's just him. That's just little boys. But I do know there are women out there who in some ways have to purse carry or they prefer it. And so, um, you know, it's, and and I've, I'm seeing more and more um, efforts by women to design purses that actually look chic and don't, there's some really ugly (laughs) purses out, concealed carry purses out there, I have to say. So there are women who've like partnered up with Italian handbag makers out in Italy and design beautiful purses, whether they're totes or they're smaller, you know, cute little um, like nighttime purses or or uh, um, like medium sized purses, and um, something that you'd want to carry and and would blend in with the rest of your handbag collection. So there are there there is more of an effort being made there, but I, I don't know how creative you can get with purse carry. There's just, I mean, you have the the slot and you have you put you stick a holster in there and that's it um and just remember which side is facing forward (laughs) but they usually put like a tassel or some kind of tie or ribbon or something on one end of the purse so that it's a visual reminder to the woman which way her um which way her grip is and which way her her muscles pointed kind of important yes absolutely Yeah, I think that um, purse carry, I, I don't know, I've always told my students, it's, it's a hard one. Like part of me wants to say purse carry is better than not carrying at all. 
And then the other part of me wants to say, purse carrying is like leaving a gun in your car. It's, yeah. you're looking at a way higher theft issue because that's generally the first thing that somebody's going to take if they're going to rob you. Um, you run into the issue where the kids, like you mentioned, you know, kids are curious. They dig through mom's purse. Um, and then you also run into an issue of how are you drawing from that and what kind of training are you getting on that? Because there's a very specific way to draw from a purse. And if the manufacturer of the purse does not understand how to safely draw or how you can safely draw from a purse, I think that the, you run a risk of the purse not being designed perfectly correct for it on top of flagging um, like your brachial artery and um, people think that because it's in a purse, they don't necessarily need training because they don't think they're going to shoot themselves drawing from it. So I think that there's a lot of a lot of different layers to purse carry that people would have to work through. But I would like to throw out there that if anybody does want a purse carry, the queen, the person you need to talk to for uh, learning how to safely draw from a purse. Although I know I do not think she necessarily condones it, but she will tell you how to safely do it is um, Annette Evans, uh, Blasting Beauty. She actually went through a really great demo with me and it was really, really good. And then I was able to show that to my students as necessary, but purse carry is just kind of one of those things that it's, it's too bad almost that it's a thing but at the same time, sometimes it's what you have to do. So, yeah. And if um, you can train correctly with it, then it works. Yeah. I yeah. especially appreciate that part. And just like with everything else, if you're going to carry it, you need to train with it. Yeah. Um, Grace, did you get the tag and chat? I'm trying to keep up. So I'm seeing okay. multiple tags here. So one is holster brands. And what's the other one? Uh, communication style. Communication style when I teach women? Yeah. Ooh. Um, I talk to them the same way that I talk to anybody else. <laughs> so they're human beings and they're equally as intelligent as men. Mia was talking about talking, um, simplify oversimplifying things sometimes. Um, you do want to make sure that you're relating to them in a way that they can understand. But I am very careful to do that with both males and females. So I talk to them the same. If, if anybody wants to learn how to shoot a gun, it's the same process because, you know, and, and every student's different. So if it's a private lesson, obviously that's going to be tailored to his or her uh, best learning style. But in a classroom, it's a generalized system for me. Absolutely, I agree. And yeah, just like what Grace or what uh, Mia said earlier, yeah, talking down is not very helpful. No, in not any, at all. In any situation, I think. And that's for both sexes. So. And I think it's really important in those beginner classes, and this is where I'm kind of breaking my own rule here and turning this into a gender thing. But I, I think it's really important that women understand and men understand that there is definitely an expectation of, of mindset to be coming on with it. And it doesn't have to be the super aggressive mindset by any means, but it's the mindset that um, I, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to be afraid of it. And a lot of that oversimplifying can kind of tend to freak people out a little bit. So nothing special. And I try to lead by example. So be a tough chick and hopefully they'll come out the other end shooting great. And they're hopefully already tough chicks. If not, hopefully they'll become one. And be a tough dude if you're not familiar with firearms tough as well. dude that's right and that's i can't tell you how many times i've had to rack a slide or load a magazine for a man before so and show them how to do it again so absolutely equal playing field there so how often did you show men and say hey this revolver would be best for you <laughs> it's just a thing. Never. Okay. do you like pink sir 
That's right. I don't no, be think I, on. I don't think I've ever told anybody that a revolver would be best for them. And it's not because maybe it wouldn't be. I do agree that there are different different things may be better for different people. One thing that I have I will absolutely do if someone is refuses to take on a safety mindset and be safe or at least try to be safe is I will absolutely recommend that they go get a can of pepper spray and take a class on that instead. If they're going to hurt themselves or someone around them because they refuse to learn how to be safe. Would you go as far as advising them to take a class where they actually get sprayed as well so they know what to expect? Personally, I think that that's absolutely a good idea. I would love to see pepper spray classes where people get pepper sprayed. But, you know, that, yeah. that's pretty overboard. That's pretty overboard. Because, you know, if you're going to use pepper spray, there's a good possibility of cross-contamination. <laughs> with, with the spray, that's but true. there's... There's absolutely there's like the gels out there and stuff that are a lot better now, or that's hmm. not so much an issue whatsoever. So it's obviously about getting the right stuff too. But yeah, what about tasers? No. Why? Ask a cop. Would he rather taste somebody or pepper spray somebody? Anybody know? Usually, he'd Based. rather pepper spray somebody, right? I can fight through pepper spray. I can't fight through tase. I can't. I, yeah, I, I, I've been I've been sprayed uh, several times, and it it just was uncomfortable. I was able to get to my objective and do what I needed to do. Tase, I couldn't move. Oh, really? Yeah. I guess it depends but on how with, high with you box. are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. Man brings up a good point. Like that's huge. Is and I think that tasers, depending on the tasers you have. Unfortunately, that's pretty, you have to get pretty close to, which if you're already in that range, then I guess it doesn't matter. But I, I like the idea of the pepper spray gel that sprays pretty far so you can create distance while you are taking care of business. My understanding with the civilian model taser is that you tase them and it, it would go for a longer duration. And basically you just put the taser down and, and bolt. Yeah, drop it. And while they're getting electrocuted, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, what do you with, think, with man? my top one, that's five seconds. Yeah. Yeah, the pepper spray one, the blowback is never fun. I've experienced it, and it was not fun. <laughs> but yeah. the, the taser, someone just told me about a new taser on the market where you can keep um you know usually you discharge the prongs and then it's done but there's this new one apparently on the market where you can just keep keep sending the current through um and it's not like you know one and done it's like five and done or something along those lines so yeah my police ones like that yeah and they're they're um, trying to market it more towards women what do you know and um trying to make that a an attractive alternative to carrying a firearm for those that don't want to carry a firearm yeah, just but I mean, and the ta yeah, but I've, I've told my girlfriends, I said, you know, tasing some, if, if you, if, if they're, if you happen to catch them outside their clothes or they're high as a kite, well, then you're screwed. Uh, so I might as well just try to see how fast you can run at that point. <laughs> well, and I think another conversation that's worth bringing up around tasers is where they land on the use of force continuum, because with pepper spray, you can pepper spray anybody for just about any reason generally. And it is considered one of the lowest forms of force on the use of force continuum. So you're actually giving, you're actually using a tool that's more or carrying a tool that's more versatile. In my opinion. Yeah. Did, Matt, do you know where the taser falls in on that use of force continuum? Yeah. Use of force continuum is kind of outdated. You think so? Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the, the, the steps, because ba yeah, basically you, you jump in where it's appropriate. So, right, you're using the appropriate amount of force for what's yeah. going on. So, right? yeah, taser yeah. versus yeah. pepper spray, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the situation. Yeah, for Cause, sure. Because tasing someone that it's already handcuffed, that's just an you just don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. In Seattle, the pouring down rain, probably not so great. <laughs> 
And now let's see here. We have more. Okay, some of this stuff in the chat we've we've covered already, so that's good. Oh yeah, um, might as well officially ask this then. Uh, what are your guys' choices in holsters, Grace? I carry my go-to is uh, the Tenacor Glock 19 holster. They have one, and um, I also have a five-shot leather inside the waistband leather one. And Mia. Um, I, well, I guess the traditional holsters, I have a Eaton Tactical, um, one and I have a JM Custom, Ky JM Custom Kydex one, but if, um, I'm not wearing a traditional holster, I like, I like my shorts with the holster sewn in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're pretty versatile. I've worn them under skirts, jeans, everything. I could probably wear those every day, but I don't. So those are the top three for me. And has Mike helped convert you over to CZ yet? He's still trying. <laughs> I, what do you carry? Bad. I carry a Glock 19, and only because that was the first gun I learned to shoot with, and I trained with it religiously, so I'm the most comfortable with it. I had the grip reduced by Boresight Solutions. Mm -hmm. And it made all the difference in the world. And actually, when I put that gun in other women's hands, their faces literally light up because they love that grip, that reduced grip. Um, you know, they, they're always told, directed towards a Glock as their first semi-automatic, but they always say the, the grip is too boxy or too bulky yeah. for them. And then they hold my gun and they say, how did you get this grip on a Glock? <laughs> and then I gave him Ben's card. And um, it, he, he has a name for it. I think it's called like a level two reduction duty series or something like that. They call him and say, I want the Guntress gun or I want Mia's gun. <laughs> the gun that you made for her. I want Mia's gun. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and what generation is your 19? Oh, just a Gen 4. Yeah, I'm sorry, Gen 3. Actually... Okay. No, Gen yeah. 4. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> One <of> the sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Ben does awesome work. He does. Um, speaking of which, I think he posted somewhere, if we bring him up, he gives us free guns. So, Really? It, no, not really. I said oh. it jokingly. We just kind of went <laughs> on. I think I it's in our helpful. networking page. Yeah. <laughs> if I can find that post, I'll tag you in it. Yeah, oh, well. he does great work. Yeah. I had a Glock 35 that he worked on a number of years ago and just, and I had, I had coworkers that would say, can, can I try that out again? Can I go shoot this? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> wow. The stippling. It's so great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's good stuff. What other, uh, yeah. What other topics do we have? Oh yeah. The uh, alternate alternative stuff carry option thingies like the the bra holster did you guys want to discuss that at all no the, although outside the a, norm because um, yeah as most men don't know anything about it yeah there's um there's a, a i just purchased it actually online and i'm waiting for it to come in the mail it's not a bra holster it's kind of like a belly band but it's it's designed to purposely sit right under your chest area. Um, okay, I'll just come out right under your breasts. So it's not mm -hmm. part of your bra, but it's supposed to sit and take advantage of that cavity of space right under your breasts. And um, it the the gun fits in sideways, and it, you can only fit a smaller gun because I told her I carried a 19, and she wrote me back and said it's it's too the 19 will be too big for that area. So um, I said okay, then make it for my 380. And I'm, I'm going to try it out and see what it's like. But um, that because I wasn't so sure about carrying a bra holster, but I wanted to see if there was another um, other than like a belly band type, if it was designed designed for a woman's body, if there was one out there. And this was the closest thing I could find. So I was going to try to try it out. But otherwise, you could just you can. I've used a belly band. Um, it's a little scratchy for me, but I've used the belly band holster around my torso. I've used it. I try to use it down around my my waist and hip area, too. But um I have hips, so it slides up and I have to keep hiking yeah. it down. <laughs> so Can Can Concealment makes a belly band holster designed for women's hips. It's, it's contoured. Um, and I've seen a lot of women uh, 
wear that particular type of holster as well. Anything on that, Grace? Um, I would say the bra holster, in my opinion, falls very closely in line with the um, purse holster in that it takes a very specific uh, training method. And if you yeah. purchase one, I highly recommend that you find an instructor who knows what they're talking about and take a class on specifically using that exact holster and do lots of reps with an empty gun. Kind of cool if there were classes that offered use of force or not use of uh, like Sims mm -hmm. where you get to test it out and yeah. Yeah, that's what well, we're planning on doing. Oh, cool. Yeah. I was like, Mike, who are they going to shoot? He said, me. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> or you. That's going to be fun. That's going to be addicting. People are going to want to come back. To shoot and do it. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm interested to see yeah. how the women will react to that because, you know, they love him. So and now they have to shoot him. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm, I'm interested to see how they're going to wrap their minds around that. Yeah. Actually, that brings up a good point. That could be some serious, like, mental conditioning training, too. Exactly. Yeah, that was kind of why we wanted to bring it up, to put them in as real a situation as possible. Because yeah. you know, women are conditioned to not be confrontational, not be aggressive, and to think that they can't protect themselves. And um, in addition to giving them that talk, you know, over the lunch hour about, no, it's in you, it's in your genetic makeup, don't fight it. Um, and, he, you know, the Viking references that I made before. And Mike also shares a story about when he was in Iraq and um, something he witnessed with a mother and a daughter. Um, we want to, you know, you get them thinking along those lines. And now we want to actually kind of put them in a simulated scenario just to have them experience it as closely as possible. It really seems continuing that that fallacy that women are weak, that's just hurting the cause. Yeah. yeah. 100%. And, it, and it hurts, you know, the perception of guns as well, because it, it, you know, it's a skill thing. It's not a physical brute strength thing. And so if you reframe your um, perception of guns along those lines, then it, it absolutely makes sense that more women should be shooting. Yeah. And we have so many cool options in carrying in the guns themselves in training. Uh, never have we had these many options. Right. It's awesome. And we have your classes that are special. <laughs> Yay. And Grace's classes. Nah, she doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> she's been on the show before. Yeah, yeah he's right. Yeah. He's right. <laughs> Whatever. This has an M16 behind her. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is that a cult? You know, I honestly don't even remember. I'd have to go back there and look at it right now. Uh, don't do that. That's that's too much effort. Yeah, it's, it's a lot but of effort. Funny, do you see this like executive chair I'm sitting in? I'm pretty comfortable. Right. <laughs> could take a nap in that. It swivels and everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you in your office or are you in some, some other area? Yeah, this is my office. Where were you before? I was in a conference room. Okay. Where we heard all the security passwords and stuff and your light kept on turning off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was like, I can't do it in there again. Got to keep the light on this time. And you have yeah. a mall right behind you, a huge mall. I do. I have the giant new uh, FDE mall. So that's the newest uh, mall we've got right now. Pretty, pretty good looking. We're really, actually really excited about it. So where's the mall man? Oh, you want to see the mall man? Let me grab him. <laughs> I have one right here on my mic. He's always there. Oh, he is right there. That's yeah, he is cute. always there. Well, yeah. Just don't get on the wrong side of his beam. There we go. It's the mall. That's him in the packaging. By the way, the packaging is just as fun as Mall Man himself. So that was before I came along. So whoever did that marketing, kudos to them. And I love the fact that it was, he was originally named Chuck Blowers. <laughs> Chuck Blowers. Actually, funny story. Um, the original Mall Man is a guy named Chad who works here. So he, Mall Man was designed after 
the guy in oh, this cool. picture. He's our main model slash um, sales and gear extraordinaire. I think Forever he's immortalized now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and those are available through, was it Weapon Outfitters? Uh, Weapon Outfitters is sold out at the moment, I believe. So right now, as of this very moment, unless um, there may be some other resellers that have them that you could look into. Um, I'm trying to think of who else would have them, but if they are out of stock, the only way to get them is to be friends of the company. So gotcha. that's why you have one, Matt. Yeah. You've and probably had yours of, a long time. It, I have. Does yours have a, a black clock or an FDE clock? Uh, FDE. Yeah, you have one of the original runs. Yep, yep, right there. Um, speaking of friends of B.E. Myers, has Bill Blower stolen the eagle in the lobby yet? Well, I did see him trying to sneak in. He was wearing, like, black spandex and set up, like, some sort of a laser beam, like... Thing he was trying to crawl through. I don't know. But the eagle's still here, so I don't think he was successful. Because he's mentioned he <laughs> wants to take that. <laughs> that is a true story. Yeah, we, we have a pretty epic, giant eagle statue, for those of you who don't know, in our lobby, and it's pretty awesome. Pretty huge. A lot of people want it. It embodies America. I think that's why Bill is drawn to it. Yes. Yeah. Who is now retired? It's amazing. Yeah. He is. He is um, one of our brand ambassadors. So we're really happy to have him on board. He's really and awesome. There he is right there on my wall. There's Bill Blowers. Oh, that's Bill. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. That's great. Will, before we shut down the feed and before you do your individual plugs, are there any topics you guys want to cover? Any last minute discussions, questions, comments, snide remarks? Um, what are the men most curious about women shooters? Yeah, that's a good question. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I trust the chat. That kind of <laughs> me. Based on the other feedback. Based on some of those memes we saw, yeah. <laughs> Although I, I like Grace's uh, shot coming out of the gates. <laughs> I that was Mike awesome. Made a Mike made a comment about that one too. <laughs> oh, he did? About your comeback, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, I think okay, that I'm, got I'm deleted. My breath. But... Yeah, it did. I deleted that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I took like, a screenshot though because it was epic. <laughs> <laughs> Can't hold my breath now. This is, this is going to be uncomfortable reading whatever questions coming up on chat. <laughs> yeah never trust tr never trust chat <laughs> yeah for me i think most of the questions have been answered oh Ooh, what advice would you I give like a firearms salesman oh that's a good that's one i've been a firearms salesman before uh, personally my advice wait let's see here okay so if you're the firearms salesman um, the same advice I would give for communicating with a woman in a class. So if it's specifically geared towards women, ask her, treat her like anybody else. Ask her what she likes, what action she likes. If she hasn't taken a class before, you can recommend that, but be careful about that because you don't want to assume that she has no education. A lot of women are taking classes nowadays, even just beginner classes. So huge amounts of uh, more women in classes, meaning more competent female shooters. And that would be to listen. There you go. That's it. Listen to what she has to say, because I guarantee that just guessing what she wants off the bat, that's not going to be what's right for her. Yeah. I, I'd say that's sound advice. And I think a safe question you can ask is um, what have you, like that, what the guy asked me, what have you shot before? Did you like it? Or what didn't yeah. you like about it? And that's a good yeah. starting point. Yeah. 
Well, you know, if you consider a lot of the, the uh, social media back and forth about firearms, there are a lot of clueless men, too. So don't assume anyone is either educated or clueless. Just ask those questions and listen. That's good. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. Advice on a pink gun. Ooh. What advice do you want on a pink gun? <laughs> yeah. Like. Find like your favorite gun and spray paint it pink. There you go. I, though, when I do go to a gun store and my daughter's with me, and she is seven, she always does pick, pick the purple and pink ones. Because she's seven. She really likes the black <laughs> ones. Exactly. Yeah, I saw, um, I mean, I, I get why they choose pink, but not all women like pink. Um, and don't assume that because she's a woman, she must like pink. Um, kind of, women like choices. I'd say give her a choice. You know, and, and, and see what she gravitates towards. And then you get a feel for, okay, is she a girly girl? Like she Because there are some women who do like the pink guns. So I can't knock them too much. <laughs> but not all women um, like pink guns. And they're going to take that gesture, if you force one on them, so to speak, as, ugh, he just sees me as this, like, he's going to pat me on the head next, you know, and, and kind of talk down to me. So um, I, if you're, if you... I mean, I guess give her a choice. If you're going to offer a pink gun, offer her something in the alternative as well. See what she likes. Yeah. I'm just looking through statements and not very many questions that pertain to this specific panel. Someone shy... Another has nothing. Are they positive? I can't see them. Oh, you're not missing anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah, most of the time it doesn't even, like, they're not talking about what we're talking about. So it's like a second conversation. Oh, okay. They're just happy to be here. They sure are. And there's some good conversation on there, by the way. <laughs> So that one question from the dude, I don't know about that one. Because personally, I'd rather have my wife use something that she's good at using. And shotguns aren't the easiest thing to use. The question is, what about trying to sell women on the idea of a shotgun for home defense use? Is a shotgun the best option for her skill sets, abilities, and her environment? If so, then yes. Yeah, if not, then right no. Now. Yeah. 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 Someone said, we come here for the chat and rewatch it later. I think there's some truth to that. Yeah. Will. <laughs> I find it interesting. If we don't have anything further, let's wrap this up. I don't have anything to plug immediately. How about you, Grace? What do you, what do you need to, what do you need to promote? Ooh, the mall, always the mall. So our <laughs> modular advanced weapon laser. Um, I have a big giant tan one behind me here, FDE. No, it's not tan, there you go. It's not tan, it's flat darker. Um, but yeah, we have the civilian version and we have a DA, that's our direct action version. And what it is, is it's a pointer and illuminator for individual weapons. And the cool thing about the mall is it completely utilizes uh, Vixel technology. So that's vertical cavity emitting a laser. And this is something that's a little bit newer and that most laser companies aren't using. So what we're getting out of that is a longer battery life, higher output, uh, clearer beams, et cetera. So another cool thing about our mall is it's completely modular. In fact, that one right here. So this is the black one. I could not grab an FDE one for this, unfortunately, but completely modular. So the head piece, we have our body piece and our tail piece, and you can completely take off the tail, take off the head, flip it around, and now you have a left-handed version. So it's completely ambidextrous. The controls will still stay the same even after you switch it. So it'll switch along with the head so that you're not 
confusing your A and B buttons. So it's extremely ergonomic. We've got three preset uh, settings here. We have our short distance for room to room clearing inside buildings. We have mid range and that's going to be for outdoor urban environments. And then we can go into lockout all the way out to far range. And that is going to be for longer distances. Um, actually, we had a guy shoot about a, I want to say it was a thousand yards with this. It was really, really cool. So it can go out pretty far. We have two modes. We have our visible green mode and a infrared. And then we also recently came out with the mall clad, which has a sphere pointer versus a visible green pointer. So you get into that short wavelength IR that most people's night vision aren't picking up unless you have a special sphere viewer. Because let's face it, in this day and age, people are using night vision apps on their phone. So even terrorists and African rebels have night vision now. And since I have you on right now, the difference between the DA and the C1 Plus. Ooh, okay, cool. The DA is a class 3B laser. So that's going to be for law enforcement and military use only or DOD use. And then our C1 Plus is our class one laser. It's completely civilian legal. The cool part about it is you are not giving up a ton of the power because we use our Vixel technology, which uses three diodes. I believe it's three diodes. So we're using multiple diodes in tandem. So it's there's still each class one, but you have three class one diodes pointing at what you're shooting at. So and everyone, right. everyone can thank the FDA for that regulation. Yes, you bake your friendly neighborhood FDA gentleman or woman a pie. It's, it's really actually unfortunate, but the C1 Plus, a lot of uh, a lot of dudes are running the C1 Plus and really enjoying it, even if they can't get a hold of the DA. So I know people are using the C1 Plus on the job and they're still finding it to outperform their former lasers. Yeah, isn't it? It's uh, outperforming a lot of the class threes. Yes. That's saying something. That's yeah. Uh, what about any uh, courses or instructor stuff that you need to promote? For me? Yeah. I do not. I'm not actually taking a sabbatical from teaching, so I'm not teaching right now. I'm thank focusing you. completely on the mall. So, <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And Mia, what do you have? I was just entirely fascinated by Grace's plug. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we have our classes that were, um, I have the uh, locations announced and the dates and what signups will hopefully be released soon. It's just a matter of getting the final details from the ranges, but we have our classes all over the country. And um, I guess as far as some other plugs, I've mentioned Boresight Solutions several times. Love his work. The women and you get love free his guns. work. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and um, we have a couple holster makers that we love to use, Eaton Tactical and JM Custom Kydex, which I think are familiar names already to a lot of people out there. And if, if there's anyone out there who still wants to see that minimalist holster that I was talking about earlier, the Vanguard with the Ulti Clip, we still have a few of those left, so they can just contact me directly. Um, and uh, other than that, I think... That's about it. Oh, and the where can people steel find targets you? that we use are defense hmm. targets. Um, Guntrust.net. It's like Pinterest, but Guntrust. But guns. Yeah. Exactly. Dot genius. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Well, let's see here. Uh, thanks to Forge Tactical, Facts on Firearms, and Varg, who is also violence of mind and. Um, Completely escapes course on the spot. I completely forget everything. Basically, Varg Freeborn, who's who's also a, a episode sponsor. Um, you can find us at primaryandsecondary.com. We do have a forum at primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. This will be on uh, iTunes, Spreaker, all the major audio uh, things, as well as YouTube, as per the norm. If you like what we say, if you like what we've been doing, 
Uh, feel free to pay patreon.com slash primary and secondary a visit. From there, you can help support the entire network. Essentially, by doing by supporting the network, you're helping pay bills, help cover all the costs and all the time that's invested in this. Also, by being a subscriber, you get access to our Discord server. If you happen to be a subscriber of $5 or more monthly, you wind up getting some access to some pretty heavy deals. As a matter of fact, we just added a new one, or just about to add a new one, from a very major retailer of high-end goods. So that's kind of nice. Um, we do also have a brand new podcast that is working parallel with this. It's called Forged Podcast. Basically, it's a one-on-one -on -one short form, about 10 minutes to 30 minutes of, of discussion. That podcast is focused far more on basically personal development, uh, character traits, and experience. That also is on all the major, uh, it's on iTunes, Google, you name it, Spreaker. So, yeah, speaking of that podcast, most likely next week, Thursday, I'm hoping sometime after 1800 hours, since I'll just be flying in that morning, uh, we will be doing a live recording for uh, the Forge podcast. It won't be a modcast. And I'll be talking to someone known as Deviant Olam, a very talented, well, he's, a, he's an entertaining person to, to, to talk to and to listen to, but this is the kind of guy that you hire to, you basically hire him to break into your corporate office and he tests your security really cool stuff there so i think that pretty much covers everything can't think of anything else uh yeah thanks thanks for being on mia and grace i found that educational i suspect others did it was interesting to read the feedback in the chat um it's interesting that we have yeah you know, it's a it's an untapped resource so many potential female shooters and uh yeah the marketing right right now is just not the best well, thank Hopefully. you, Matt, for giving us a chance to express, you know, our point of view and helping yeah. us keep up the dialogue about women shooters. And, yeah. and you guys are welcome anytime. And if there's anything you need to, to discuss, let me know. We can have a special episode. Same with if you need to promote stuff, let me know, because I'm always happy to help. Great. I think until then, I will talk to you soon.